Hello there, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to show you how to do Monte Carlo simulations in Excel without an add-in. Uh, now, there's a lot of great add-ins out there. At risk is probably the most common, uh, and it does some pretty complex things. The, the, the issue is, A, your scenario or the reason why you want to run uh, Monte Carlo may not be that complex. And uh, B, you may not have the money. Uh, you may not want to spend a couple thousand dollars to get the add-in uh, to do the more complex Monte Carlos. And you want to use the existing functionality that Excel offers. And, and, and that functionality is still sufficiently robust to do the great many uh, uh, scenarios that you'd want to run. And so today I'm going to show you one from the perspective uh, of a real estate investment. Uh, this is for a real estate blog. I'm a commercial real estate uh, uh, professional. and so. It makes sense to to, sh to do this tutorial based on real estate. Nonetheless, uh, if your application is different than real estate, the majority of these concepts are going to be transferable to your application, uh, regardless of what that application may be. So let's get started. Let me frame first the scenario. Uh, we have a hypothetical apartment building that we'd like to purchase. We know we know a little bit about the apartment building. We know about the market. We have a feel for where uh, rents and expenses and values are going to go over the next few years. But we want to run the Monte Carlo simulation. We want to run, run a thousand simulations to get a feel for the different uh, possibilities that could, he, could be here and ultimately to arrive at a value that we would be willing to pay for this property today. Okay, so uh, f framing the investment here, uh, it's a 10 unit apartment building, a little tiny thing. A one out of 10 units or 10% of the property has been consistently vacant. And so given the simplicity of this exercise, I'm going to say that there is nine uh, revenue units. Now, in, the, in a real analysis, we would be modeling vacancy separately, and that would be its own assumption, et cetera. But for this case, to, to keep it simple, I'm just going to say there are nine units that produce uh, revenue every month. And that revenue is $1,000 per unit per month. and over the last few years, rents have been growing at about 3% per year. Then in terms of expenses, property costs about $3,000 per month to operate. And that expense uh, historically has grown at about 2% per year. Next, cap rates for comparable properties today range somewhere between 55 and 6% based on our market knowledge, et cetera. And we project, given the interest rate environment, that cap rates will grow by about five basis points a year uh, over the next few years. Well, we expect to hold this for five years. And so we're anticipating cap rates to be, the, the terminal cap rate, or the cap rate at which we sell the property, to be somewhere in the 5.75 to 6.25% range. So for now, I'm going to drop in 6% for our terminal cap rate. And lastly, a discount rate. Now, we'll be discounting the future cash flows that we're projecting this property to throw off, we're going to be discounting that back at some discount rate to arrive at a present value. And that present value is what we would be willing to pay for the property today uh, based on that discount rate. And that discount rate, a good way to think of it is it's the return uh, without any debt added in, so our unleveraged return uh, that we expect to get from this property or for, for an investment of this type given the risk. In this case, we're going to say 8%. So we want an 8% return unlevered. Next, we're going to build out our DCF. Now, to do that, we're first going to do rent. And this rent, we year one is nine units. I'm going to use an F4 to make that cell absolute for 12 months, right? Multiplied by our monthly rate. And that gives us our first year's uh, rent. However, we're going to grow this rent at some unknown yet to be determined growth rate, which will, be, will, will fall in cell D15 here. So I'm then going to, going to multiply this value by 1 plus this as yet determined growth rate. Use F4 to lock that in. And then I'm going to raise it to the current period minus 1 power. And, and why minus one? That's because we do not want to grow this in year one. But then in subsequent years, in year two, for instance, it will be raised to the one, so it'll grow it by this growth rate. Gro year raised to the two, so it'll grow it by this growth rate twice, et cetera. And there, we copy that formula over. And because the 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 cells were locked in appropriately, uh, made absolute appropriate, appropriately, uh, we can just copy it over. And then you'll notice if I drop in just for fun, three percent growth rate, our rent growth. Well, we'll do the same thing for expenses. 3,000 F4 times 12 times our growth rate. This is an expense growth rate yet to be determined. Oops. 1 plus this expense growth rate, F4. 
and raised to our period minus 1. And then we copy this over in a similar result, 2%, then you can kind of get, get a feel for this growth rate. L last, we do net operating income to complete our income stream for the property, and that's simply this formula, rent minus expenses. Again, very simple um, example, but it, it serves its purpose. Last, we're going to, to, to finish off our DCF for the most part here, we're going to uh, uh, determine the residual value. What's, what are we going to sell this for at the end? Well, we talked about the 6% cap rate being kind of the middle between the 575 and the 6 and a quarter where we think cap rates will be at this point in time. So we're going to take NOI in year 5. Now I realize convention is to use the next 12 months, but in this case, to be simple, we're going to use trailing 12 months. And we're going to divide that NOI by this cap rate, this yet-to-be-determined cap rate. And gives us, remove those, okay, and it gives us this residual value. And so our net cash flow, right, is net operating income plus the residual value. And here we have our net cash flow stream. Again, the fifth year being a combination of our net, the net operating income from that year plus the sale, uh, the proceeds from the sale that we get in that last year. And then we're going to discount these cash flows back at this discount rate in this cell equals NPV. No, this is not an actual NPV. Um, uh, NPV is uh, the present value of cash flows less your cash flow in year zero. Excel, for some reason, calls this NPV function, but it's not the same as in finance. Nonetheless, it's equal NPV. Our rate is 8%. Our cash flow streams that we're discounting are there. And that would be our DCF value, or, or if you will, the value at which uh, or the value we would pay for this property to hit an 8% return. And you can, you can confirm that by simply going equals negative, right? Put, a ne put this is our purchase price and then use an IRR and run internal rate of return on that and it's 8%. Notice it's the same. So in order to hit an 8% uh, 8, 8 return, this is what we would pay for the property today, assuming these cash flows. Now, what's the, what's the issue with, with this scenario? Well, this is very much a static view. It's our best guess of rent growth in the future, our best guess of expense growth in the future, our best guess of terminal cap rate, et cetera. And so why not, instead of having kind of a two-dimensional two view here, let's make this more three-dimensional. Let's look at the possibilities. And on top of that, let's simulate thousands of possibilities. And what, what we learn from statistics is the more simulations you have, the more that those simulations or, or the output or the result of those simulations tend to follow kind of a bell curve or a normal distribution where you have, you have this mean in the middle and um, there's a 68% probability that the, the actual result will fall somewhere between one standard deviation either below or above that mean. 95% within two standard deviations, 99% within three standard deviations, etc. And so if we add some probability to our assumptions here, we can get a better picture of the range and the risk involved with this investment. So let's do that. The, we're going to add probability to three assumptions, rent growth, expense growth, and our cap rate. And so let's start with rent growth. I think, based on his, historical information, that rent will grow by anywhere from negative 1.5%, meaning it can, could actually fall, or up to 6%. I'm pretty bullish about this market. I think, I think uh, rents have a lot of room to grow. There's a lot of population expected to come to market or, or come to this, this city. Uh, there's going to be more demand for apartments. Um, homeownership rates are falling, et cetera, what, whatever. But I believe that there's a higher probability that rents will grow than that they will shrink. But there's still a probability that they will shrink, uh, but I think a greater probability that it will grow. And so I think they'll fall somewhere between a range of negative 1.5 and, and 6 point, 6%. And in order to model that, I'll use a RAND between function. And, and how do I do that is I'm just going to take this 3%, F4 to lock it in, and I'm going to multiply it by a RAND between. And what RAND between does is it, it outputs a whole number between two numbers that, that you specify, right? Now, the problem is I can't just simply put negative 0.5, which negative 0.5 times 3% is that negative 1.5, right? Which is kind of our low, our, our low band. And 
two, which is our upper band, because ran between, because it only outputs whole numbers, will only in this case, case output zero, one, and two, and therefore for, we'll only get three scenarios, either a zero percent rent growth, a three percent rent growth, or six percent rent growth. So in order to solve that, I do a negative, and I'm going to do a larger number. I'm going to say negative 500 and negative 2,000. And now this is going to output something between negative 500 and 2,000 whole numbers. So 2,500 different outputs are possible here. The issue is uh, if I multiply 3% by, say, negative 500, that's going to be many times uh, uh, less than our negative 1.5%, which is the low of our band. So I'm just going to divide this by 1,000. And what we get then, if I hit... F9 to update these, right, is all sorts of scenarios. And these scenarios, again, are fall, going to fall between that negative one, one and a half and six percent. I'm going to do a similar thing for uh, expense growth. I'm just going to copy this formula. But the difference is instead of three percent being the center of this band, it's going to be two percent. So that will, it will vary between negative one percent and four percent, which I feel is within the band of what it's historically been and what it's likely to be going into the future. Finally, exit cap. So we said exit cap rate is going to fall somewhere between 5.75 and 6.25 percent. To model that, again using a RAM between, we're going to take this kind of middle ca terminal cap rate, multiply that by ran between, oops, ran between. And I already did the calculation, but it's 95.83 is the bottom. 104.17 is the top. I'm actually going to add a zero. I'm going to move this over one decimal. So 958 and 1,000. 041, okay, and then divide that by 1,000. And what this does, again, I did the calculation on the side, but this is essentially at this low band, it'll be 5.75. At the high band, it will be six and a quarter, okay? And then I run a couple of different scenarios, and you can see how that changes around, etc. okay? And with that, I have, watch this, this DCF value. Every time we update, and you can hit F9 to update. Just hit F9 each time you hit F9, it updates. So let me show you then how to run the actual Monte Carlo. So we have the setup in place, we have variability, each scenario uh, is different. What we're going to do is you're first going to take this cell. So actually, first you're going to, uh, I just like to write simulation number, and then I'm going to number this down the number of simulation that I want. In my case I'm going to do a thousand. So uh, cell B28 I do one and then I do B, cell B28 plus one and then I'm just going to copy these all the way down. Obviously I've already done it but you just copy it down until you got to a thousand right and you copy it there and then you have a thousand simulations okay and then you're going to select from oh I'm sorry and then finally the cell right next to your heading, not next to your first value, next to your heading for your simulation number, you're going to link this, in this case, to my DCF value or to whatever value we want to see how that value changes for a simulation. Okay? And once we have that, we, we're just going to select from the simulation label all the way down. Uh, we're going to go over one column and then all the way down so that we're selecting the simulation number and that empty column to the to the right of our simulation number. And this is what it looks like, right? So it's all simulated or it's all selected. Then we're going to go to data ribbon, what if analysis, data table. And this little data table uh, box pops up. We're going to leave this row input cell empty and we're going to take the column input cell hit this little icon to the right, and we're going to select any empty cell in the worksheet. We, we, you need to make sure it's a, a cell that will never have any information, but an empty cell, and then we hit enter. And then we hit OK, and there we go. As we scroll through, this is run a simulation for each one of these iterations all the way down. And what we have, and I've built out here a little mean, median, min, max, and standard deviation. And so we just write the formula. So average of these cells 
is that, okay? Our expected value is the mean. Okay, so that's our expected value. Median is, let's just see where the median falls. The median falls right pretty close to the mean, and that's, that's to be expected because we're using uniform uh, probability here. Our minimum is using a min function, uh, 945. Our maximum, in this case, is a million five twenty-three, and then our standard deviation is one thirty-eight. And so, what does this really tell us? Uh, it tells us that, based on you know these assumptions that we have the mean or the expected value, what we would be willing to pay for this property is about 1.2 million, okay? Uh, with the minimum, though, being about 933. So there are, there are situations where we would need to only, or, or we could only pay 933,000 to hit our 8% discount rate. And if that scenario were to occur and we were to pay a million too, we're going to make less than our 8% target. The max, though, is a million five. So we could pay up to a million five. There's a scenario in which we pay a million five and still do an 8% return. And so if we, pay, if we pay our expected value a million two, and the, the scenario that, that yields this actually occurs, we will make more than our 8% return. Let me show you one last trick where I'm going to build the distribution into a, um, a, a, a scatter chart, if you will, here that will show where each one of the distributions is on this line. And how I do that is I'm going to use a small, the small function in Excel. Okay, and, and this is going to find within a array where this value falls based on where you know what number that is within the array. So what we do is we take uh, the array, which is the total number, uh, or, or um, yeah, the, all of the values, and then the k is the simulation number. So we lock in the array, we leave the simulation relative, and then we just copy those down. And I already had the chart. This chart here is just a scatter plot of these values. But what we've essentially done is we've taken these values and we sorted them smallest to largest, and then we plotted that out on a scatter plot. And now you can see where our range falls. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, contact information is in the description. And thanks for your time.